hosts and the presenters today, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third session of our IPPW webinar series. Before moving to today's topic, I would like to say a few words about IPPW and what we are trying to accomplish with the webinars. The International Plant Free Pro, Pro Workshop was founded in 2003, and almost every year since then, we have held a week-long workshop and, uh, and short course focused on the exploration of planets with probes, landers, and aerial vehicles for a community of scientists, engineers, and technologists. The workshop has alternated between the U.S. and Europe, and this year would have been held in Monterey, California, two weeks from now, but for the intervention of COVID-19. So instead this year, we've organized a series of six webinars, two weeks apart, most of them time for the convenience of attendees in the continental U.S. and east across Europe, the Western time zones in Russia, and as far as India, where it's now 8.30 p.m. For the benefit of those unable to participate in person, including those in the Asia-Pacific re region, where this is the middle of the night, we are recording each session. Those recordings can be accessed at the IPPW 2020 website, which is easily located by Googling IPPW 2020. Now, an important part of IPPW's mission is the nurture of the next generation of contributors to our field. Session four to be held in two weeks' time will focus on young researchers, and at the end of today's program, Raj Venkatapathy will be telling us more about session four. Session five, four weeks from today, has been scheduled at a time that is convenient for the participants from Japan, South Korea, and Australia. And that session will include an introduction to our next face-to-face -face meeting, IPPW 2021, which will be held in Tokyo in September of 2021. And now to introduce the subject matter of today's webinar session three, I'm delighted to welcome Michelle Monk, who among the many responsibilities at NASA is principal technologist for entry, descent, and landing at the agency. Michelle has a longstanding interest in the topic today. And I believe that the first time we met each other, it was in connection with early efforts to understand the potential of error capture and to move the technology forward. I can think of no one better qualified to set the context for today's session and to explain why it is so timely. Michelle? Thank you, Jim. Thank you to everybody who's joining us today. We're very excited to have a great uh, session on aero capture. I want to first start out by saying that aero capture is not a new idea. In fact, it's been studied for over 30 years. Back in the late 1980s, there was something called the Aero Assist Flight Experiment, or AFE project. It was a, a blunt heat shield that was to be released from the space shuttle payload bay, perform an aero capture, and be recaptured by the shuttle to uh, return to Earth. There were many wake flow experiments behind that aero shell. And I was actually a young co-op student at Johnson Space Center at the time of its development. And I was uh, serving in the branch where the thermal protection system tiles were being glued on to the aeroshell um, as I was at work. Um, ultimately, the project was canceled because there were many, many experiments on it and there was some cross growth. But it showed that uh, everybody was very excited about aero capture and its potential for the future. Um, from that point, uh, we were studying a Mars sample return project for 2003 and 2005 timeframe. Uh, we're still studying Mars sample return today and we're closer than ever uh, to getting that mission uh, to be a reality, which is very exciting for all of us. Um, but at the time, uh, we were partnered with our colleagues at the European Space Agency and they actually took the shape of that aero assist flight experiment vehicle and were going to aero capture the orbiter at Mars that was to uh, return the samples to Earth. Um, so we were very ready and eager to implement aero capture on a high profile mission for NASA and the world. 
Um, but since then, uh, there's been technology development and many studies of error capture, many discussions of risk. Uh, the Science Mission Directorate uh, for several years had a technology development project uh, called Arrow Capture, and I was the technical lead for that area. Uh, we performed system studies of Arrow Capture for science missions at uh, Titan, Neptune, Venus, Mars, and even put in a proposal for an Earth flight demonstration in 2006. Unfortunately, the program that was going to uh, potentially fly that mission uh, was canceled as well, um, but we had a, a very big storehouse of information about aero capture and felt that we really understood the system and its risks. So that kind of brings us to today, uh, where as we get ready for the kickoff of the Planetary Decadal Survey, uh, which will set the science priorities for the next decade. We're very excited to look into the Entry, Descent, and Landing Toolkit and really see what could enable or enhance these science missions of the next decade and beyond. So this uh, revisit of aero capture is very timely. Aero capture has many benefits for science missions. It can increase the payload that we can deliver to orbits. It can shorten trip times for the outer planets. And it can give small satellites new cost-effective capabilities to extend their reach. So the talks we're going to hear today really bookend the applications of aero capture from the small satellites, which are really starting to make their way into the planetary science arena to the flagship missions of, uh, to the ice giants, which we all know will be a focus of the decadal survey. So now I'll turn things over to Etheraj Venkatapathy, who will introduce our speakers. Raj is a senior technologist for entry systems technologies at NASA's Ames Research Center in California. Raj, take it away. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, before I introduce the first speaker, I want to point a couple of things. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a bubble, and you are able to enter your questions through that section if you click on the bubble. And uh, my colleague Jacob, who is online, he will be monitoring those questions. And at the end of the first talk, we will have uh, a few minutes, five minutes or so, uh, for some of the questions, uh, Jacob will moderate that. And then we'll move on to the second speaker. We'll do the same at the end of the second talk. And then time permitting, we'll have more uh, question and answers that uh, Jacob will uh, moderate. So with that uh, note, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce the first speaker, Alex Austin. Alex is a system engineer in the Advanced Design Engineering Group at JPL. He works on new mission concept formulation and proposals in all areas of exploration. He is the lead engineer for TMEX, JPL's concurrent engineering design team on CubeSats and SmallSat missions. His recent work has focused also on innovative technologies in support of planetary science missions with SmallSats. Uh, Alex received his bachelor's degree in aeronautical and mechanical engineering and master's degree in aeronautical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Alex's talk today is going to be on enabling and enhancing science exploration across the solar system, aero capture technology for small sat to flagship missions. Alex, take it away.
Alex, I think we uh, can't hear you. Um, can you check your audio? Uh, folks online, we're having some operational challenge. Alex is trying to connect with us. Uh, he may have to restart his uh, connection to the network. How about now, checking audio? Yes, Alex, we can hear you. Awesome, all right, I'm sorry about that. All right, let me go back to the slides here. Okay, you can still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, great, so I'll give my introduction again, not just talking to myself. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, sorry about that. Uh, so my name is Alex Austin. I'm from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, in uh, Pasadena, California. I'm gonna start out my talk um, a bit general and uh, give some of the history and overview of aero capture. And then as Michelle and Raj said, get into the small sats specifically, um, and then uh, close it out with a lead into SOM's talk on some of the larger missions. Um, and uh, before I start, I want to make sure I acknowledge that uh, the work that I'm presenting today is really the, the work of a very large group of people across NASA at JPL Ames and Langley. Um, and it's really my honor to be able to present uh, it to the community. So first, a um, little bit of rocketry 101. Um, this is the rocket equation, and this is really what governs all of interplanetary exploration. Um, this is how we get to other planets, and um, it's uh, at its fundamental, it, uh, it uh, tells us that for large amounts of delta V, for large changes of velocity, um, with a traditional propulsive system, you need lots of propellant. And uh, this is an exponential relationship, so as you need more and more velocity, you need more and more propellant. And this is why we have planetary orbiters where they launch and their, you know, half or more of their mass can be devoted to just propellant and a large propulsion system. Um, so aero capture is kind of a different way of doing things. Um, and uh, it's really a way to break free from this rocket equation um, to enable new types of missions. So this is, uh, if, if, you, if you're familiar with aero capture, as Michelle said, it's not a uh, brand new concept. Um, it's been around for a long time. Um, you can picture it, I kind of like to explain it as somewhere between a lander and aero braking. So with aero capture, um, we're going to a planet, we're on an incoming hyperbolic trajectory, we enter into the atmosphere, we use drag from a single pass through the atmosphere to provide the delta V needed to transfer our orbit to a closed ellipse around the planet. Um, so uh, with a lander, we're gonna go all the way down to the surface of the planet, um, with aero braking, we're going to propulsively insert and then skim through the atmosphere many, many times to adjust our orbit. With aero capture, we're going to go in and we're going to skim in and then come out. Um, so the, so that, that you end up with a spacecraft that looks kind of like somewhere between an orbiter and a lander. So if you look here, let me just kind of walk you through this. So we approach the planet. In this case, this picture is showing Neptune. We enter, we skim through the atmosphere. We start to slow down very quickly due to drag as we're moving through the atmosphere. And important is that during this, during this phase of the mission, there's a, we need some kind of control scheme um, to control our flight through the atmosphere. And I'll touch on a couple different ways that you might be able to do that in uh, different ways that have been proven are and are being studied. We exit the atmosphere and now we're in this elliptical orbit. Um, but there's this very important maneuver, the periapsis raise maneuver at the first pass through apoapsis, because the orbit that we exit after leaving the atmosphere 
still has periapsis, the closest point of the orbit, down in the atmosphere. So we have to do this small maneuver at apoapsis to raise our periapsis up out to the final science orbit. Um, and there may be other small adjustment maneuvers um, to correct the orbit as well, but this is kind of the core of aero capture. Um, so the real difference here is that because we're using drag to slow down, um, we're not using the rocket equation, right? So we're very flexible with aero capture to changes of velocity, and we can deal with very large changes of velocity on the spacecraft because we're using this resource at the planet, the atmosphere, to use the drag to actually slow down. So aero capture is a capability that um, really spans the solar system. Um, I have some examples here. This is kind of the lay of the land for, um, at least in my opinion, the near term for aero capture technology, um, kind of in the next decade or so. Um, uh, anywhere with an atmosphere is uh, a candidate for aero capture, though we focus on specifically Venus and Mars, close to Earth, um, the ice giants, and then the Saturn system, and really Titan. Um, so uh, there's been studies for aero capture at the gas giants at Jupiter and Saturn, um, but as you can imagine, since they're, they're so big, the entry velocities of those planets are so high um, that it can be really stressing on the system. Um, so we focus more on uh, Mars and Venus, um, and then Saturn is kind of unique because uh, we can use Titan as an aero capture engine to perform missions around the entire Saturn system. And then, of course, the ice giants where, um, and that's going to be the talk that Sam's going to be giving, where there's some really, really great benefits for aero capture going out to the ice giants. Um, so you'll notice here I've labeled small sats and large missions. Um, we're focusing at least right now on the small sats kind of close to home at Venus and Mars. And the reason for that is because um, as you get further from Earth, there's other challenges with small sats like power generation, telecommunications. Um, so we're focused at least right now um, mostly on the small sats for the Venus and Mars applications, um, but then the large missions really throughout the solar system. And as technologies improve for small sats, there's potential for them to also go further out as well. And aero capture can be a really great technology to allow them to enter orbit at those larger, uh, larger uh, further away destinations as well. So Michelle touched on this. Why do aero capture? What are the benefits of aero capture? Um, I'm actually going to uh, uh, skip the one on the left for now and start with the middle pane and the right pane of this slide. Um, these are really the kind of general benefits that span almost any aero capture mission. Um, the first is the ability to go fast to your destination. Um, you can cut time off the uh, interplanetary cruise to a planet um, because you can arrive at a larger velocity. So normally when we want to go to another planet, if you want to get there faster, it means you're going to be coming into the planet system at a faster velocity, which means that you then have to do a larger burn of your propulsion system to slow down. And as we know from the rocket equation, that can very quickly become a major problem because you can't carry that propellant. But with aero capture, we're flexible to delta V. So especially going out to places like the ice giants where they're very far from Earth and we want to be able to get there faster, um, aero capture can allow us to take a couple years even off the flight time. And the plot that I show here in the middle, these are some potential trajectories to Neptune. And you'll see that um, we're, we've plotted delivered mass versus flight time and then these dots are colored by incoming velocity. And as you get to shorter flight times, the incoming velocity grows larger, which can make repulsive orbit insertion impossible, but makes aero capture very feasible. So the second general benefit of aero capture is increased mass efficiency. And this is due to the need to, to carry less propellant. So you can either go faster, you can carry more mass, or both. There's a, there's a place in between, too. And carrying more mass, more useful mass, means potentially more science instrumentation. It could open up co-launched architectures where you have like an orbiter and a probe, an orbiter and a lander. You have multiple orbiters. Um, it really gives you more useful mass, and that's really the, the benefit to take away here. So finally, let me go back to the left pane, um, and this is going to be the focus of most of the rest of my talk, um, the small sat specifically. Um, so the picture you'll see here is of the Marco CubeSats, um, which we're very proud of, the first interplanetary CubeSats that launched with the InSight mission um, to Mars. 
But the Marco CubeSats, they were, they were a flyby. They had no capability to get to orbit. And the challenge with small sats is that um, they're very often launched as secondary payloads, which are very mass and volume constrained, um, which means it can be um, impossible to carry the amount of propellant that you need to actually slow down and enter orbit. Um, so we've focused on small sat aero capture technology as a way to enable these small missions to enter orbit at planetary destinations and perform really compelling science for less cost. Um, so that's going to be the focus of my talk, and I'm going to kind of wrap it up to, for Sam to, to touch on the larger ice giant missions. So small sats, Michelle mentioned the, that small sats were getting bigger and bigger in the planetary science community. They're becoming more and more important. Um, what does that kind of look like? So um, normally when we think about small sat planetary science missions, um, we think of what we call the ESPA ring. You might have seen this before. There's a picture in the top left corner. Um, the ESPA ring is a way to launch secondary payloads of about uh, 200 kilograms or so. Um, you'll see about 60 by 70 by 90 centimeters. Um, this replaces the launch vehicle adapter on a large primary mission so that you can have secondary payloads that can share the ride of the rocket going to Mars, Venus, um, you know, anywhere in the solar system. Um, so there's a real capability to get these small missions launched away from Earth. Um, but we've got to complete the equation and slow them down and actually create orbiters. And that's where we see aero capture coming in. And um, Thomas Serbukin, our, um, uh, the NASA Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, has made it very clear that every future NASA mission is going to have one of these ASPA rings to carry secondary payloads. Um, so we really, we, we know that these small sats are going to be bigger and bigger in the, in the coming decade. And we also know that there's some uh, small launch vehicles, like from uh, companies like Firefly Aerospace and Rocket Lab with their electron launch vehicle, that have the capability to also potentially launch small payloads to other destinations. But again, we have to be able to complete the equation and actually allow them to slow down. And that's where we see the aero capture technology coming in. So what does aero capture look like for a small sat? Um, so this picture is uh, almost identical to the picture I showed on my second slide, although it's been augmented with a new control scheme in the atmosphere. Um, so we're still entering, we're, you know, we're coming in on this hyperbolic trajectory, we're slowing down to enter orbit, um, but you'll see that there's this number three drag skirt separation. Um, this is really the way that we think that we can allow these small sats to perform aero capture and use something called drag modulation flight control to give them the control authority that they need to target the correct orbit during their flight through the atmosphere. Um, we then exit the atmosphere, we uh, unpack from our aeroshell, we perform the periapsis raise maneuver, and then we're in our science orbit. So what, what does this drag modulation flight control actually mean? So um, I'd like to show this um, with the plot on the left. So you'll see on the left, this plot is for um, different uh, apoapsis altitude targets at Venus. Um, this is atmospheric deceleration versus time in the atmosphere. Um, so if you take the integral under this curve, you'll get delta V. And you'll see that there's this big step function where the curve decreases. And that's the jettison of this drag skirt. So if you look at the picture on the right, the way that the flight system's configured, you have this spacecraft, um, and it kind of looks like a traditional probe. And then you have this drag skirt attached. You enter the atmosphere with this large drag skirt. Um, you have a very low ballistic coefficient, so you have very high drag. You start to slow down very quickly. And then at some point, you jettison that drag skirt. And by modulating the time that you jettison, you can move that vertical line on the plot to get more or less area under the curve, more or less delta V. And that allows us to account for things like navigation uncertainty coming into the planet, um, atmospheric uncertainty um, uh, on the day of flight, because we can use a control algorithm based on input from the IMU on the spacecraft that is uh, telling the spacecraft when it's reached the correct velocity to then jettison the drag skirt and switch to the um, high ballistic coefficient, low drag configuration. So this is, a, this is a potentially really simple way to do flight control on a small sat. Um, and with small sats that are very cost, mass, volume constrained, we want to make this as simple as possible. And that's really what we're driving towards here. So what's this flight system look like? Um, 
This is a, we, we've spent a few years researching this. Um, this has been a great partnership amongst the NASA centers. Um, this is what we think that this would end up looking like. So you have your ESPA ring that I mentioned, um, and you have your spacecraft, and we use a deployable drag skirt, and the next slide's gonna go into a bit more detail on that. Um, this is the ADEPT technology developed by NASA Ames. Um, and this deployable drag skirt allows us to stow within that ESPA volume um, to meet the constraints of uh, secondary launch with the primary mission. Um, we launch with that primary mission, we jettison off of the um, off of the ESPA ring, we then deploy the drag skirt, we cruise to the planet just like any other lander or uh, um, probe mission that we would that we would fly. Um, we perform aero capture, we jettison that drag skirt when we're in the atmosphere that provides the control authority that we need, and then we end up and we have this small sat that's available to perform science around uh, around the planet. And given the designs that we have now, you can imagine this is kind of a 100 kilogram class spacecraft. So this is not a little tiny CubeSat, but it's definitely a small sat. It allows you to deliver um, a few kilograms of science payload, a few U's of volume um, to places like Venus and Mars. So let me touch on this ADEPT drag skirt because this really is a critical piece of, of making this technology work. Um, again, because we're so volume constrained, we have to be able to stow the drag skirt for launch. Um, and the ADEPT technology has been um, spearheaded by NASA Ames. Um, they've been very successful. They just had a launch of a sounding rocket. You'll see this awesome picture on the right here. This was a 70 centimeter um, demonstration of the ADEPT technology um, at Earth. Um, so ADEPT is uh, kind of like an umbrella. You have the carbon woven fabric that provides the thermal protection system and also um, uh, takes on the deceleration loading as you're flying through the atmosphere. And that fabric, it's uh, stretched over a set of ribs that can uh, deploy and stow kind of like an umbrella. And um, the ADEPT team has studied multiple different classes of ADEPT um, from the small sat class, kind of three meter or less diameter range. Um, we're looking at a one and a half meter class for our small sat um, to larger systems as well, going up to six, 10 meters, and even into you know, very large um, for flagship missions or human missions. Um, so again, this is really a critical part of what allows us to do this on a small sat and to stow into that small secondary payload volume. Um, the ADEPT technology for the deployable drag skirt. So um, again, we're kind of, we're focusing on Venus and Mars, um, and uh, I put together here some nominal trajectories to a 2,000 kilometer orbit just to illustrate the differences of Venus and Mars. Um, so the top plots are uh, altitude versus time, um, bottom plot is deceleration versus time, and you'll see the major differences are that so Mars, the atmosphere is much less thick than at Venus, so we spend a bit more time in the atmosphere. We also dive lower to a, to a lower altitude to reach higher density. Um, and uh, similarly, the um, maximum deceleration at Venus is higher than at Mars uh, for the same reason. Um, also, uh, Venus is gonna have higher heating rates, so we're, we're currently looking at a round of 400 watts per centimeter squared for Venus, with Mars being uh, much less at um, closer to only about 70, 70 watts per centimeter squared. Um, but both of these uh, are within the capabilities of heritage thermal protection systems, so we don't think there's a, a new technology there. Um, uh, we, we, we think that uh, that's very feasible for us. So these are nominal trajectories, um, just to illustrate the, uh, the differences between the two planets. Um, but it's also important to consider um, uh, orbit targeting accuracy in uh, the control authority that we have and what orbits we think we can reach. So these plots here, these are put together from a, a series. Um, on the left, you'll have Venus. On the right, you've got Mars. Um, this is plotting apoapsis error versus the capture orbit altitude that you want to target. So the way you read this, if we look at the Venus plot, for instance, if you say, I want to go to a 10,000 kilometer apoapsis orbit, um, you again can look on this and you can say that with the drag modulation system, we'd expect that you would reach 10,000 kilometers plus or minus about 1,000 kilometers. Um, and really what this is showing here is that um, the drag modulation system is not perfect. 
we're not able to target an orbit, um, you know, exactly within only a few kilometers, but it gets you to orbit. Um, and for a small sat, we think that that's, uh, that's really good enough. Um, small sats, if, even if you can get to an orbit that's a little bit floppy, that's going to be enabling for these small missions. Um, but it is also important to mention that you can carry a little bit of extra propellant to perform a cleanup maneuver if you do need to clean this up a bit. And that cleanup maneuver is going to be a lot less than the multiple kilometers per second that you'd need to reach these low orbits um, purely with a propulsive orbit insertion. Um, so as I mentioned, this has been the culmination of a lot of work over the years. Um, and I did want to touch on just a few of the uh, key pieces of technical progress that, um, that this team's been able to uh, push forward and gain this technology ready to fly. Um, on the left, you'll see the results of some recent ballistic range tests that were performed at NASA Ames. Um, these were with small subscale models. You'll see with a U.S. penny for scale on the top. Um, these are very small models, but we have the probe and then we have the drag skirt. We actually were able to launch those out of the ballistic range and see how the drag skirt separated from the probe in flight. Um, and uh, to uh, get us a really great data set for how we expect that separation to occur and provide some experimental validation of stability during that separation event. Um, we've also performed some um, CFD analysis and we have plans for continued work in this area of the separation event at Venus flight conditions. And amongst the many things that the ADEPT team has done, um, as I mentioned before, they recently had their successful sounding rocket flight test of the technology. So we really think that um, this, this technology is, is just about there and it's, it's really ready to be flown um, and to enable these small science missions. So with that, what are some near-term flight opportunities? So Michelle mentioned um, uh, there were some prior studies for different types of flight tests for aero capture. Um, we've been able to really take from that and learn from that and uh, this is a flight test that we've envisioned for the drag modulation system. Um, Sam's going to give a great talk about why um, other systems like lift modulation for the ice giants are ready to be infused into missions. Um, but we see this as a really great near-term flight opportunity for the small sat drag modulation system where we can do an earth flight test. Um, we can launch as a secondary payload to a highly elliptical orbit. We then dip down into earth's atmosphere perform a single aeropass maneuver to go to a lower orbit. And this can demonstrate all the technologies of the drag modulation system in an end-to-end -end mission at conditions that are relevant to interplanetary entry. Um, and because we're a small sat, because we're very low mass, we're low cost, um, we really think this can be a very cost efficient um, way to demonstrate this technology um, and to get the drag modulation aero capture system out there and ready to go for um, mission infusion with small sats in the next decade. So I do want to close by just mentioning that um, there really is a, a, a large potential for aero capture across the solar system. Um, I've focused on Venus and Mars for the small sats in this talk, but um, especially at the Saturn system, um, we can use Titan, as I mentioned, as really the aero capture engine for future missions at Saturn. You can either go to Titan orbit or you can do a pass through Titan to enter Saturn orbit to uh, even get to Enceladus, um, which is one of the um, ocean worlds that we know that we want to explore. Um, and then beyond the Saturn system, and this is going to be Sam's talk, is the ice giants, where um, we know that we, we're going, we need to have a great orbiter mission to the ice giants, um, and especially decreasing the trip time to get out so far from Earth is a really, really great benefit of aero capture. Um, and uh, we're really excited about the technology to uh, enable and enhance these types of missions across the solar system. So just to wrap it up um, and lead into Sam's talk, um, so aero capture uses the drag from a pass through the atmosphere rather than a large burn of the propulsion system to enter orbit. It really allows us to break free from the rocket equation is the way that I like to say it. Um, this can enable greater payload mass or shorter transit times to planetary destinations, and that's especially true as you get further out um, to the Saturn system and to the ice giants. Um, as I've shared, recent research and technology development has focused on aero capture for small sats using drag modulation, um, and we really think that this can be enabling to allow these small missions as secondary payloads 
to enter orbit and do, you know, decadal class science for much lower cost. Um, but uh, in, there really is opportunity for aero capture as, as a capability across the solar system. I think Michelle um, uh, made that point really well at the beginning of the talk and mentioned all the studies that have been done for this technology, and we're really excited about it leading into the next decade. So with that, um, we are working on a, a white paper. Um, uh, SOM is also working on a white paper, so I, I'll, I'll kind of be the lead into this, but I'm sure it's going to come up later in his talk, too. Um, the white paper that I'm leading is uh, focused on aero capture as a capability across the solar system with small sats, two flagship missions. Um, we really want to um, share with the decadal community the potential for this technology, um, all the work that's been done to get it ready for missions, um, and we're really excited about this. So I've got my email on the slide here. Um, we'd love to have uh, co-authors, endorsers. If you're interested in seeing a draft of the white paper, please reach out to me. i be happy to share that and uh, get any feedback. We want to make sure that we really can bring the community together on this, as Michelle said, um, leading into the next decade. And Sam will share some more information on his paper, which is a, uh, both of these are really being written in parallel um, with each other to, uh, to get aero capture out there and make sure that we're sharing this with the decadal community. And once again, I just want to wrap up by saying that, uh, you know, while I was uh, able to present this to you today, this is really the, the work of a very large group across NASA. Um, it's been a pleasure working with them, and uh, we're really excited about this moving forward. So with that, I think that's my time. If there is time for any quick questions, I'd be happy to take them, or um, I can respond in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Jacob? Take it away. All right. Thanks again, Alex, for an excellent talk. Um, so uh, again, if you have uh, questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A, and I'll read them out verbally uh, to Alex. Um, so to start, uh, this is from, uh, apologies, I'm going to slaughter the name here, uh, Shayama uh, Narendranath, um, which is, uh, what is the main parameter that decides the angle of the drag skirt, um, 45 degrees here? Um, so there's a couple things that go into that. Um, one of them is the stability of the flight system. So um, a 45 degree uh, uh, shape is generally going to be more stable than say a 60 or a 70 degree. Um, in the designs you see here, we focused on 45 degree, mostly to build from heritage of previous missions like Pioneer Venus. Um, although we have identified more recently in our research that um, from a packaging perspective, it may actually make sense to go to a larger cone angle. And uh, one thing I didn't mention in the talk, but it is important to mention, is that um, this aero capture event happens entirely in the hypersonic regime. Um, so that separation event that I showed, that uh, at least at Venus, it happens at something like Mach 40. Um, so we're going very fast. We're entirely hypersonic. Um, and because of that, um, we believe that you can probably go to larger cone angles and still maintain stability. So it really comes down to a trade around um, packaging of the spacecraft, um, heritage of other designs. Um, it's a parameter that can that can definitely be traded. Um, and that's a great question. Uh, so I have another question here. Um, do you think that drag modulated air capture would fit within simplex, um, or uh, would it be more limited to larger funding opportunities? So that's, that's really, that's a great question, and that's really what we're targeting here. Um, so the, the Simplex program is a, is a NASA program for, for small planetary science missions that are constrained to that ESPA volume. Um, that's why we've, you know, we've designed to uh, ensure that we can fit within that volume. Um, and uh, we're really designing for that, and that's our plan, to be able to fit into the Simplex program. And, and we, we think that there's definitely a, a way to make that happen. Um, so this is a question from uh, Lisa Backer. Um, what's the potential of lift modulation for Mars and Venus small sats compared to drag modulation? So I, I do think that there's potential there. Um, with lift modulation, uh, you're going to have some uh, other challenges when shrinking down to a very small platform. Um, you're, uh, the integrated propulsion system that will be needed for control can be a challenge um, 
for, for small sets especially. Um, uh, we've really focused on the drag modulation as the simplest architecture, again, because the simplex program especially is, is so constrained in cost and mass and volume. Um, so I, I do think there's potential for that, um, but we've really tried to keep this as simple as possible for the small sets. And that's why we've, uh, we've zeroed mostly in on the drag modulation system. Okay, maybe we'll do one more question before moving on to Sam. Uh, so this is one from Andrew Ball. Um, is the ADEPT system for lift to drag equals zero only, or is there any benefit from adding um, some center of mass offset to create a lifting trajectory? That's a good question that I don't think I have a great answer to. Um, I know that the ADEPT team has done some research in um, uh, lifting bodies with ADEPT. Um, our, our focus up to now has been with L over D of zero. We just fly ballistically. Um, for the drag modulation system, again, keeping it simple, I think that makes the most sense. Um, but I think that that's an area that um, uh, probably deserves some further study. And uh, hopefully if we can get aero capture um, moving forward as the technology, we really want this to be the spearhead, um, you know, to continue expanding and improving on the technology as, as we move forward over the next few years. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Alex. We can move on to the next talk now. Um, it's again my pleasure and privilege to introduce the next speaker, Shomu Datta. Dr. Datta is an aerospace engineer in the atmospheric um, uh, flight and entry system branch at NASA Langley Research Center. His current research focuses on flight mechanics simulation and modeling of plant reentry systems. Uh, Dr. Datta obtained his PhD and master's uh, MS in aerospace engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology and his BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Sam's talk is going to be on aero capture as an option for ice giant missions. Sam, take it away. Thank you. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. Yes, okay. we can hear you well. Thank right. you. Awesome. Thank you, Raj, for the intro. And um, Alex has done a lot of my job for me by introducing the concept of error capture and what we're thinking about for the white paper. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more specifically about the error capture options that are out there for Uranus and Neptune, the ice giants missions. Um, just like uh, Alex mentioned, um, even though I am getting to present this work, um, really we're working with a large team from NASA Langley, NASA Ames, JPL, as well as uh, some academic partners as well. So I've acknowledged them in the end, and uh, but this is really a group effort. So why ice giants? Um, the, the planets Uranus and Neptune have only been visited by one flyby, and that's been uh, the Voyager 2 mission. And a lot of information that we have about these two planets are from that flyby, as well as remote sensing from um, Earth-based observations. And uh, what we've seen has led us to be really excited about these planets. Uranus has a very interesting uh, axis orientation obliquity, and Neptune has um, a very interesting moon, Triton, which is supposed to be a Kuiper belt object. And more recently, with the Kepler Space Telescope, we have noticed a lot of exoplanets that are very Uranus and Neptune-like when you're talking about their size relative to Earth. So this is a chart that's a little bit outdated at this point, but really there's probably even more data to uh, prove the point that a lot of the planets that we're finding out, uh, outside of our solar system look like uh, what they call sub-Neptune or hot Neptunes. Hot Neptune because it's closer to its star than what Neptune is. So again, it's really, really important for us to visit these two planets. And uh, even the last decadal looked at that. It was a high priority item for um, that decadal. So I believe that coming into this next um, decade, um, these two planets continue to be high priority items. Um, I'll, I'll go a little bit again through what error capture is, even though Alex did a really good job of talking about it, because I want to point out some things for um, the ice giant system that it would enable us. So 
we come in in uh, interplanetary trajectory in a direct uh, uh, trajectory, and usually for the ice giant planets, you're coming in at very large V infinities, um, your uh, atmospheric relative velocities when you get to Neptune, when you get to um, Uranus are rather high. And in an air capture, you enter the atmosphere and you're basically doing a delta V within the atmosphere because that atmospheric drag is slowing you down. You come out in an exit orbit and at the apoapsis, you have to do a burn. Otherwise, you're going to go straight back into the atmosphere again. And um, usually there's another burn at uh, the next cycle, at the next periapsis, where you do some apoapsis corrections to get into the real science orbit. Another thing that happens that's not listed here, you may be doing some other small burns to do plane change maneuvers or to get uh, the true anomaly correct to be whatever you want it to be for your final science orbit. And that's a little bit important because uh, when you're going through the atmosphere, air capture allows you to get flexibility both in the downrange and the crossrange direction. So not only can you get the energy states right, the apoapsis and periapsis, but you can also get the inclination of the orbit uh, corrected within that one burn. So that's a really effective maneuver for air capture. Uh, another thing that it does, and it may not be obvious in this cartoon, uh, because you're doing a direct entry coming through the atmosphere and coming out, you're really carrying your orbiter and probe with you through this uh, maneuver and coming out. So really when the probe may be separated from the orbiter, you're doing that once you're in a captured orbit. This gives you a lot of flexibility so that you can target the specific place on Uranus and Neptune you want to go to, kind of avoid problems from past missions where we have dropped the probe potentially into places that are not as scientifically valuable. You can really target where you want to go. Now, I think Michelle mentioned this as well as Alex, air capture has really been studied for a long, long time. And I'm kind of keying in on air capture studies for the Ice Giants missions. Uh, we've had studies in 2002 that showed that the on-orbit mass can increase significantly over all propulsive options if you use error capture. Um, I've put these citations on there so that hopefully when you guys see the slides, you can go back and look at the uh, presentations themselves because it's really good work. You can see how uh, trip time uh, can be reduced. Uh, it does increase in entry velocity, but you can also see how much usable uh, payload is increased. Uh, more recently, we had the Ice Giants pre-decadal survey study in 2017. Um, it wasn't focused on error capture, but there was an appendix uh, that looked at error capture, and um, there's a quote from it saying, air capture technology could enable trip times to be shortened, deliver mass to be increased for both. So basically the same concept coming through. And uh, more recently, uh, there was a JSR article that came out that uh, really surveyed error capture across a uh, whole different group of uh, planetary destinations. And once again, for the ice giant, specifically for Neptune, uh, we had an observation that if advanced flight control options can lower the lift to drag, the L over D that's required for these vehicles, we might even be able to use um, a high heritage blunt body air shell. That'll become an important point in a, here in a second as I go through the presentation. But the seminal work for error capture for uh, the ice giants was the system study that was done in 2003, so uh, 17 years ago. And I think uh, Michelle mentioned that there was an error capture um, study that was funded around that time for multiple different planetary destinations. So I'm going to focus in on the Neptune error capture study that was done. We were targeting a science orbit that was very elliptical and uh, did a Triton flyby several times. And the system study was able to size the orbiter uh, with 792 kilograms of mass and two separate entry probes. But what we saw um, coming out of it was that, A, this, um, by enabling air capture, we had um, trip times reduced by three to four years. Um, this is using trajectory data that is um, not for the 2030s. But I think you can kind of understand the trend that you can have a trip time reduction by uh, multiple years if you use error capture. More importantly, um, error capture provided uh, approximately 40% more on orbit mass compared to the all propulsive option, which is a pretty sizable increase to science payloads, especially for planets which you have never had an in situ observation in the past. And, um, but th this did come at a cost, at least for the study. You needed to develop a mid to high lift to drag vehicle. And um, I've shown here 
pictures of multiple vehicles that they studied, um, they end up with a shape called lip sled, this modified lip sled. So unfortunately, at least 17 years ago when we were looking at this, it seemed like we needed to develop a different shape of entry vehicle than we traditionally use, the blunt body, circones, capsules. Um, and they also mentioned that the thermal protection system environment was challenging, uh, especially using the materials that were available in 2003. So here's a little bit of a systems look at a, a stoplight chart of where people were worried about, at least back at that time, 2003. So that's the point of departure. Um, we were worried about atmosphere, but there were some other things that we were considering that could potentially ameliorate it. Um, you did need a new shape. So aerodynamics was something that needed some more investment. GNC was okay with this new shape, but uh, that what we were showing was the GNC needed a very, guidance navigation control needed a very high um, lift to drag ratio. Uh, and there were some uh, questions about thermal protection systems, structures, and aerothermal stuff. And where we ended up was with a shape like this, that looks like, um, that, that is called the lift sled shape. Now, since then, we have had a lot more capability developments in uh, specifically three areas that I'm gonna to talk to you about, where I believe now we can show that higher heritage blunt body vehicles can be used to accomplish the same kind of missions that the air capture study talked about. And um, that's great because you don't have to develop a new vehicle. So in the past, when we've looked at air capture performance, specifically looking at Neptune and Uranus, we have really flagged two items. We've flagged guidance navigation and control strategies and thermal protection system. But as I mentioned, there are three new uh, capabilities that we've developed in the 17 ensuing years, uh, including that we have new TPS material that's, that have been developed to meet the requirements for Uranus and Neptune direct entries. The guidance and control schemes itself have matured and have been developed. And now through our studies, we've seen that under even robust conditions, uh, lower lift to drag heritage entry vehicles. So we're talking about lift over drag of 0.4 and lower um, could enable uh, error capture uh, with robust performance. Um, and ultimately, we have also uh, noticed uh, newer capabilities in optical navigation that uh, improve the vehicle state knowledge. It's a big component of the robust performance analysis that we do for these error capture missions, the navigation error. And the navigation error can be brought down for the outer planet. So let me go a little bit in depth into each of these capabilities. So the first capability is a thermal protection system. And uh, what we had seen before were that past studies had shown that we needed a high performance uh, TPS material for the ice giants missions where the heat flux was higher and the stagnation pressure was higher. And of course, we wanted this to be a lightweight material so that we're not using most of our um, mass for the vehicle on the TPS material. Well, since then, we've had developed and maturation of the high performance heat material and PICA material. And again, I have uh, cited a paper here by Raj uh, that just recently came out that really goes in depth into the work that has been done for heat and PICA with a lot of, um, specifically with heat, a lot of ice giant in mind. Now, um, I'm, I have a more of a GNC background, so I'm gonna little, talk a little bit more in depth into the guidance methods, probably a little bit more than the other capabilities. And um, one thing to note, uh, back in the day in 2003, uh, we were using more analytical methods. These were methods that were, were games were based on pre-generated reference profiles. These were not an iterative and uh, not an iterative code, but these were very efficient code. Uh, but since then, more work has gone into um, numerical predictor corrector schemes, the NPC schemes. And what these are, uh, they're integrating the equations and motions on the fly on the vehicle, basically at a set increment during the whole time you're doing the error capture maneuver. Uh, these are iterative code, but they are adaptable to modern flight software. And um, more importantly, because they're uh, numerically integrating at various segments along um, the trajectory, they can be robust uncertainties in atmosphere and aerodynamics, because as it's seeing different force being felt by the vehicle, uh, that's from uncertainties in the atmosphere, or uncertainties in the aerodynamics, it can adapt to that. So the cartoon here is showing how you, it's looking at various potential trajectories and is then choosing a specific trajectory to meet the exit condition, but really it's adapting that trajectory along the way. So it's not just picking a priori one. As it moves forward, it can change it a little bit. 
Um, along with guidance uh, strategies, uh, there's been a lot more work done on control mechanisms. So back in 2003, when they were studying this problem, we were looking at mostly bank angle control, which is traditionally um, a control mechanism that's been used for hypersonic guidance. And what it is, is basically you fly at a trimmed angle of attack that is not zero, so you have some lift force, and then you're using the bank angle to roll the vehicle around, um, and so you're moving the lift force up, down, sideways, and this way you can create some force to move the vehicle trajectory around. Uh, but besides that, there are a couple of other control mechanisms that have um, looked at a lot more, have been matured a lot more over the last 17 years. Uh, one is direct force control, where you're really directly controlling the angle of attack and side slip. It's almost like flying uh, using different um, uh, control surfaces of an uh, airplane. So you can control angle of attack differently than side slip angle, and hence you can really have a more uh, direct control of where your trajectory is going to go. And uh, one mechanism might be using flaps to get the direct force control. And then um, uh, Alex talked to you a little bit more about the drag modulation. I have here a cartoon that kind of shows you uh, you're coming in with a low ballistic coefficient, you get rid of the drag skirt, and then you get to a um, slightly higher ballistic coefficient vehicle, and that separation, allow, the choice of the separation kind of allows you to target different um, uh, energy states with your air capture uh, orbit. So these are, again, multiple ways to do air capture, so that's kind of that's something that we hadn't considered 17 years ago, but that, that's in our tool set now and uh, really enable us to do um, error capture. And um, to kind of look at some results here, what I have shown you here is a histogram of the total delta V that's spent by the error capture maneuver. Now, I said the total delta V, I really mean that apoapsis correction and the periapsis correction maneuver um, that I talked to you about. I'm not including the plane change ones in here just for simplicity, but um, you can go from the analytical work that was done in 2003, where you're using a three sigma high um, 300 meters per second of delta V. Uh, we can robustly do uh, these things with even lower uh, lift over drag, meaning more blunter bodies like the heritage entry uh, shapes um, within the same type of delta V, even lower uh, delta V. Now, this, this all may seem like it's not incrementally that big of a change in control strategy, but the big thing is you're not using a lift over drag of 0.8 anymore. You're now in the bounds of lift over drag of less than 0.4, meaning you can use blunt bodies, not the lift slip shape. And just as a point of comparison for the same trajectory, the all propulsive option, which is kind of the baseline that people use right now to go to Uranus and Neptune, would cost you 2.87 uh, uh, kilometers per second of delta V versus we're talking about 238 meters per second of delta V. So what we've seen, the control strategies really enable you to uh, uh, use heritage shapes. Another thing that enables you to come, bring back to uh, their heritage shapes instead of developing, developing a new vehicle um, is the optical navigation work that has been done. So OPNAV, as it's called, uh, is required really for the ice jams missions because we don't know the ephemeris of Uranus and Neptune very well. We don't have any orbiters around them like we do with Mars, and they are farther away from Earth than uh, any other planet. So our knowledge of their ephemeris is poor. Uh, now this technique, the OPNAS, was really used also for the Voyager 2 flybys, but what it does is it augments the traditional radiometric data, the delta door type of measurements that we get from deep space network by Looking at, uh, basically, with a camera, taking a picture of the planet um, uh, in the background of uh, stars and being able to use the, the location of the stars in the background and the planet in that frame to uh, figure out angular position of the planet with respect to the spacecraft. So it's improving the relative knowledge between the spacecraft and the planet. And uh, one, one reason why this is really, really uh, good to use for um, uh, ice giants is that the, the round trip lifetime between Uranus and Neptune to Earth is greater than about eight hours. So if we could do this online on the vehicle, that would reduce time of processing and you're really improving the knowledge of the ephemeris. And that's really what is the recent advancement. It's the auto nav capability, onboard autonomous navigation. Uh, you can process these images on orbit and you can do the orbit determination right there. 
Um, also, as you're getting closer and closer to Uranus and Neptune, the lifetime problem is getting higher, of course, for Earth, but um, you're getting more precise measurements in the camera for the, uh, the planets, and really your capabilities improve even more if you can use AutoNav uh, as you're getting closer to the planet. So all these three capabilities then finally let you go from a new concept, a new vehicle like the lift blood shape, is something that you've already seen before. You've seen the sphere cone rigid bodies. Here you're sh I'm showing you the 2012 Mars Science Laboratory, which is a 70 degree sphere cone vehicle, but a sphere cone nevertheless, or going into something like the Orion spacecraft that we're developing, spherical rigid air shells. These are vehicles we know very well. It's not a new vehicle we have to design. And uh, we're seeing now that air capture at uh, the ice giants can be done with it. So, well, I mentioned to you why air capture is so great. Well, why has, have we not done before? And I think Michelle kind of tr um, touched on this a little bit. We've really tried to do air capture many, many times in the past. AFB in the 1980s was going to demonstrate air capture, but then it was canceled. And not canceled because air capture is a risky uh, topic. It was just canceled for other systems, uh, other uh, budgetary related reasons. Uh, we had thought of air capture as the initial baseline for the 2001 orbiter that's part of the Mars sample return that Kness had uh, also led. And basically these things then eventually just didn't pan out, These both, both these scenarios, because we went to lower risk posture for uh, Mars EDL with um, the Mars polar lander and the climate orbiter uh, failures in 1999. And again, not anything to involve with air capture, it's just other things happen and an air capture was, um, the victim here for that particular issue. Um, and we've really looked at air capture and compared it to other um, orbital insertion uh, methods. We've talked about all propulsive options here, but um, when we have done a probabilistic risk assessment of air capture with respect to air braking, um, something that's an accepted air assist maneuver technique for orbital insertion, you could see that air capture is far superior to air braking in terms of sensitivity, uh, in terms of a lot of risk that um, you can uh, quant quantify. And again, I have cited a paper that kind of looks into that um, more in depth. And what air capture has come from is a perceived risk in uh, air capture guidance and atmospheric and aerodynamic uncertainty. And I would say that maybe in 2003, that was perceived risk, but since then we have shown that the guidance schemes can be demonstrated in more constrained and stringent conditions aka EDL, an entry, descent, and landing. Entry, descent, and landing, you're trying to target a parachute deploy point or a landing point on the ground, very specific target, versus with error capture, all you're trying to do is get to a entry state, not a precise point in sky, just to a certain entry uh, or to a certain orbital energy. So um, we have demonstrated EDL hypersonic guidance since then on Mars Science Laboratory, EFT-1, we might be doing that very soon with Artemis-1 as we're doing uh, lunar return. And um, even if error capture guidance is not been demonstrated, it, ha it can certainly be bounded by these EDL applications, which are more stringent. And for error capture, if we miss the target energy a little bit, we can do a small delta V to clean up the error. And that delta V is nowhere in size to doing an all propulsive case. Um, I should also mention that um, air capture pretty much stays within the hypersonic regime versus traditional EDL has staging events, has uh, aerodynamic instabilities in supersonic and subsonic phases. So once again, air capture is an easier problem than EDL and we're doing EDL already. So I think you can make the case that air capture um, is already a problem that we can bound with our current knowledge. Um, and also recently, we have looked at studies on how to pack ice giant mission orbiters, which uh, require large high gain antennas, which re require um, some way to do heat reduction from the RTGs on board. And um, that, that kind of work has been looked at to see if it can fit within the blunt body. So I'm showing you here some pictures from John Elliott's work that was presented uh, earlier this year at the ice giant workshop in London. And you could see how an orbiter like that could fit with a rigid body. So ultimately, I think, I hopefully you come out of this and you can see that error, error capture can be a enhancing tool for um, planetary, uh, planetary missions where uh, we can 
increase the on-orbit mass by 40%. We can reduce the trip time by uh, multiple years, two to three years. And that um, the air capture can be an enhancing technology specifically for ice giants for sure. And uh, with the modern capabilities that we've developed over the last uh, 15 years or so, we can even use blunt body aeroshells that we know very well about for this uh, mission. Now, just like uh, Alex, we are putting together this in a white paper. So uh, the white paper talks very much, uh, says the same kind of things that uh, my presentation did. So if you're interested to be a co-author or endorser, uh, please contact me. Uh, my email address is listed here as well as the uh, first slide. And I would like to finally end with acknowledgments from uh, colleagues from multiple centers who have really helped as well as uh, some people in academia whose work has been very beneficial. Thank you. Thank you, Saw. Jacob? So we have a question here from uh, Giovanni. Uh, could you please comment on the relationship between aero capture and aerogravity assist maneuvers? Um, well, so air capture is going into an orbit around the planetary body that you um, are doing the maneuver through. So, for example, you saw with Neptune, you went through the Neptunian atmosphere, and then you are in a Neptunian orbit. But the air gravity assist, um, it's, you're not, you're still in a hyperbol uh, uh, hyperbolic orbit outside um, when you're leaving, when you're exiting, you're still uh, not ca in a captured orbit around the planetary body. So that's the difference. So you're basically doing a slingshot, uh, and the slingshot, the gravity assist is through the atmosphere instead of just staying outside the atmosphere. Another question, uh, could aerobrake or electric propulsion be a mass efficient alternative to aero capture um, in addition to just comparing it to propulsive insertion? So um, aerobraking would certainly not be a very good uh, surrogate for this because you would be doing multiple, multiple cycles, especially to get into the kind of orbits that you need for Uranus and Neptune. Um, and you're coming in with a very large UV infinity, so you're, um, and your uh, atmospheric relative velocity is also very high. So um, it's just not going to be a very feasible operation for uh, air breaking versus air capture, where in one pass you're in orbit. Um, ultimately, also with air breaking, you have to do a propulsive burn at the very beginning to get into some sort of captured orbit. So there's a large delta V penalty there that air capture won't have. Now, um, with uh, uh, electric propulsion, you could come up with some trajectories where you have um, you have some mass savings, uh, absolutely compared to uh, pro propulsive only options, chemical propulsive only options. But these are going to be longer trajectories, so the transit time is somewhere where air capture would potentially win out. All right, here's another question. Um, so are any of the planetary concept mission studies this year for ice giants considering air capture? And if so, and if so, why? And if not, why not? So I'm, uh, I believe none of them are using air capture. I am affiliated with the Neptune PMCS study. I don't want to go into too much detail of that study, but if you guys had uh, attended any of the PMCS workshop uh, the last few days, you would have seen the Neptune study. Uh, they decided to go with um, a direct entry type of atmosphere, uh, uh, um, a concept where uh, direct um, orbit, I guess, direct interplanetary trajectory type of orbit rather than an air capture orbit. And that was just for risk-related reasons or um, basically that's the concept that the PI wanted to look at. Um, since I was part of the team, I had uh, looked at air capture initially or suggested air capture, but really basically that was the choice that the team made. I don't think um, it was because some, that air capture is specifically something that can't do that trajectory. It was just a choice that the team had made. I would say that that's kind of the point that I want to make with my white, with the white paper and with this presentation. Air capture just has not been looked at when it gets to the proposal level. Uh, a lot, and I think that's because of the perceived risk that I kind of pointed to a couple of slides ago. And so I'm hoping that with this white paper, with some of the studies that I'm citing, people will go back and look that really air capture is not beyond our reach. It doesn't really have those perceived risks people have in their mind. Here's a question from Asul Garija. 
Uh, one of the main concerns for ice giant error capture is the large heat loads, uh, which can be several hundred kilojoules per square centimeter, which leads to significant TPS mass fractions. Are there any planned studies to quantify this TPS max fractions for the, this, these types of missions? So for um, this particular white paper, we are uh, looking at some very, very preliminary, very, very um, a quick um, sizing for the TPS. Uh, but of course, this is not at all the high fidelity CFD analysis that we would want once the project uh, would be selected. So we will have some numbers in the white paper eventually for that. Um, but I would like to point out one thing to you that with an error capture, you're still staying in the hypersonic regime. You're uh, definitely having um, a large heat flux and a large heat load, but it's nowhere as high as what the entry probe would do. So uh, a lot of these concepts that we're studying for the ice giants um, that are even fully propulsive, uh, they have an entry probe. And so the TPS uh, needs for that entry probe are often much uh, more stringent than, than what the air capture uh, orbiter would do. Gotcha. Um, so here's a question from uh, Rohan uh, Deshmukh. Uh, can you comment on how NPC guidance can be potentially robust to large uncertainties experienced for, at the ice giants? Well, I, 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 all I was trying to say here is not that I, I'm not certainly suggesting that you can't use analytical uh, guidance schemes at all. Uh, what I'm trying to say more is that, that there are more choices since um, last time we looked at the uh, guidance strategies for a error capture, and we do have more work developed for the NPC, the numerical predictor corrector strategies. Now, one advantage that NPC strategies have is that you are updating the trajectory on the fly while you're flying versus with the analytical method, you're kind of limited to where your gains were developed a priori, and you you may have a reference trajectory that you may be following. So those kind of things could limit you a little bit more in the analytical strategies than the numerical strategies. But by the way, I'm not suggesting that uh, you have to use one or the other. I'm just trying to showcase that there are more options than when we last looked at it before. This is a question from uh, Januel Cabrera. Uh, is drag modulation the control method of choice for the ice giant missions at this point in time? So I believe that um, the work, well, the, the work that I was showing was not showing drag modulation uh, results. It was showing bank angle and uh, direct force control. Uh, we haven't really looked, uh, or at least I personally have not looked so much into the drag modulation side of the field. But um, it's certainly a possibility. I'm, I'm not going to discount that here. And that's, again, making the point that we really have increased our tool sets since uh, 2003 when, you know, for some reason, error capture looked like, well, you needed, some, you needed a new vehicle, so that's why you have to live with it. Um, drag modulation could be an option, um, although um, I think a lot of the robust uh, performance analysis that we've done so far, not just me, but also in the field, have traditionally looked at bank angle and direct force control for the Ice Giants mission. And we're talking about larger vehicles here anyway. These are the flagship type of kind of vehicles, not the small size type of vehicles, where I think drag modulation really is um, a very good uh, method. All right, so I'm going to open it up for more general questions now. So if you have anything for either Sam or Alex, feel free to type it into the chat window. Um, so, Alex, if you could uh, um, turn your uh, audio back on so we can make sure we can ask either speaker here. Um, so a question that uh, um, I didn't ask you uh, during your talk earlier, this is from Juicy Falcone, um, about the Earth flight tests. Um, so for an aero capture target around 80 kilometers of altitude, which is sort of somewhat of a low altitude, how strict and complex is the regulatory environment for this type of test? Yeah, so I mean, that, that's something that has to be considered and has been considered before um, in other studies for Earth flight tests of aero capture. Um, obviously, we take, in, we take that into account. We're very careful to design so that the um, path itself is happening over a place on Earth that, you know, is over an ocean and won't cause any problems if something does happen. Um, and, and we're very careful to make sure that we take that into account when doing a test like this as has been done for other uh, EDL uh, tests in Earth's atmosphere. 
Uh, here's a question from Alexander uh, Zabitsker, and either one of you feel free to answer to this. Um, what are the estimated heat fluxes that a vehicle could experience during air capture entry? And are there ideas of using a similar systems to send small payloads from the ISS to Earth? So I think I answered part of that in the Q&A a little bit already. So uh, the heat flux numbers, of course, depend on um, the planetary entry situation. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, we had a quote from Athol, um, uh, kind of giving you the kilowatts and kilojoules type of numbers on the ice giants versus uh, maybe much lower um, uh, heat fluxes for the inner planets. And as far as doing uh, reentry, um, what I what I mentioned was that you certainly these are EDL vehicles. At the end of the day, that's the cool thing about air capture. We're not talking about designing something new that we haven't done before. So these vehicles are EDL vehicles. They can certainly be used for reentry, even for um, you know ISS down mass to Earth. We have looked. There are some studies that are out there that have looked at that before. Uh, but with error capture, we're talking about getting into another orbit. So we're talking about an orbit transfer, uh, not so much uh, reentry. In fact, we don't want to be reentry vehicles. Uh, so this is, a, I think, another general question for both of you. Since you're both involved with these uh, error capture white papers, um, what is the timeline and availability for being involved in these white papers? Um, I think there's a number of people who'd be interested in reaching out to you. Um, uh, so what's the timeline for making that happen? I can start that, and Alex, you can uh, add in on your side. So both Alex and I have been working together with the core group, and we have drafts of our white paper ready to go. At least on my side, I'm just waiting on um, some um, reviews, and then we'll we'll be able to send it out to folks who, want, who are interested in it. The white papers are due on July 4th uh, to the decadal, and we plan on submitting it by the end of June. So really in this next month, uh, we're gearing up for, um, you know, adding more content to it. Uh, the white papers are short. They're limited to just seven pages, including references. Um, so you're gonna have to be very tight about it, but we're looking for endorsers and co-authors really from uh, various different institutions and uh, disciplines. So not just engineers, but also scientists who uh, see the need for error capture for some of these missions. All right, so here's a question from uh, Thomas Reimier. Uh, how do you, what do you see the biggest research needs at the moment in order to advance aero capture technology to the point that they could be infused into a mission? Alex, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'll go first. So um, I think it's important to, when considering that question, to split up the different, um, the different applications and control methods of aero capture. So Sam shared why, um, you know, the heritage blunt body lift modulation designs that we have are really ready for ice giant mission infusion. Um, when we think about the drag modulation, um, what's really critical for us is that separation of the drag skirt, which I mentioned occurs at hypersonic velocities. Um, and that's why we see something like the Earth flight test being um, a really great possibility for that system to be able to reach um, the relevant velocities for interplanetary uh, entry and actually be able to demonstrate that separation of the drag skirt from the main spacecraft to have that technology uh, be ready for mission infusion as well. Want to follow up with that, Sam, at all? No, I, I think Alex hit it right on the spot. All right. Uh, so to make sure that we uh, end on time, I think I'd like to uh, hand this back to Raj um, for any uh, closing um, announcements. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you, Sam and uh, Alex. Uh, before uh, we close the session, I have one request and one announcement. <clears throat> I think you heard the speakers uh, give you their uh, perspectives as to Aero capture uh, utility, as well as the need for the community to speak uh, for the decadal uh, committee to advocate for aero capture. So, Sam and Alex will be sending out uh, you know, an email uh, 
to all of you that attended this uh, session and request your support. And uh, they will be able to send their draft uh, pa uh, white paper also soon. So please do respond to them. And if you're inclined to support it, please do sign up. I think this is a, a community thing. This is part of IPPW's charter is also encourage. We talked about that at IPPW last uh, uh, year in uh, uh, Oxford. Next, I want to remind everyone that we have an exciting webinar next time. It's going to be a lightning presentation by outstanding young researchers. In the upcoming webinar on June 11th, the exciting presenters and uh, researchers, uh, student researchers really, they will be given five minutes to describe their ideas to all the participants. Following that, each presenter will be given more detailed uh, presentations in splinter session in individual breakout rooms. I'm sorry, I said breakout rooms, that's a COVID slip on my part. It's really a breakout area that uh, we would be able to accommodate the specific speakers to talk to a smaller group. And uh, th this, is, this is one of those things that uh, uh, this, this community coming together, including the students, is something that uh, we want to continue to maintain. So I'm really looking forward to it and uh, hope you're all able to attend. Finally, I want to thank our two speakers. Thank you very much for doing a great job. And uh, also thanks to Michelle, Jacob, Jim, and the entire JPL IT team that's invisible to us for a marvelous job that uh, we are able to then listen to all the talks. Finally, without the audience, we would be speaking to ourselves. So thank you all for attending. We'll see you next time. Stay healthy, stay safe, and goodbye. Bye, everyone.